This is Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I am your host, Mark. Today's guest really brings back some memories. Please welcome Sheila Shukla from Magnolia Street String Band. Sheila and I go way back, like way back, all the way to elementary school way back. Now, there's a little bit of catching up in this episode sprinkled throughout Sheila's story. She talks about how she used to force her sister Rita to help her figure out harmonies she was hearing before they could go out and play. And eventually, growing up in 80s and 90s New Jersey, she got into metal and alternative music pretty heavily. But at one point, she became mesmerized by bluegrass. She tells exactly what happened and when it happened. And she became so obsessed with the sound in college, she had a great support system to help her learn and figure out how to play what she was hearing in her head. But life snuck in and put some of the music ambitions on hold for a bit. But music has a tendency to make its way to the forefront, and so it did with Sheila. She met some like-minded folks and formed Magnolia Street String Band in 2013. The band has a very impressive pedigree and a beautiful classic bluegrass sound. After some false starts, they released their debut in 2019 and then had to wait with the rest of the world for things to open up post-COVID to play again. Sheila and the band have a new album coming out, and it's unique in the bluegrass world, and just about any music world. It's called By the Light of the Moon, and it's basically a children's album that doesn't sound childish. It's written for kids, keeping in mind that parents have to listen to it at the same time. So why not make it enjoyable for both? Look for it starting on National Children's Music Day on October 4th. Follow Magnolia Street String Band on Facebook, at MSSB Music on Instagram, or go to magnoliastreetstringband.com. Give us a follow at Performance ANX on Instagram and X, and our merch is available at performanceanx.threadless.com. Support our coffee habit at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety, and get ready for a very sweet episode with Sheila Shukla of Magnolia Street String Band on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. The worst one, okay. It, I'm very happy to be on Performance Anxiety. I'm super stoked to talk to you, Mark, and um, and to know you're doing such great things. My name is Sheila Shukla, and I'm in Magnolia Street String Band. We have a brand new album coming out soon. It's called By the Light of the Moon. It's our second album. And it's a kid for, I'm sorry, It's a, you're going to post that one, I know it. <laughs> It's an album for kids and grown-ups. It's a bluegrass album, and I hope you'll check it out. Our single's dropping July 26th, By the Light of the Moon, and the full album will be out October 4th, National Children's Music Day. Okay, you better make me sound good now, Mark. Hey, Sheila, how you doing? Oh my gosh. So nice to see you. You too. It's been 30 years. <laughs> you look the same, right, Mark? Yes, yeah, so do you. <laughs> it's crazy. We look the same. I mean, my God, we didn't even age a little bit. I know. That's the worst part about you is you know how old I am. I can't <laughs> We won't even mention that on the actual podcast. Oh, cheers. Cheers. Cool. Hey, I love that you're doing this podcast, and I have to tell you, I listen to it. You're so good at this. Oh, thank you. Did you, always, did you always know about this, or did you go to school for like communications? No, not at all. Went to school for it's photography. Your music fandom that's doing it. I yes, think. yeah, and it started off actually. So it'll give you a brief history of of the podcast. It started off uh, a buddy of mine. We were working the same job, and fairly soon after I moved up here, I guess. And um, I'm a huge college football fan. Uh, okay. Alabama, that's my school. I'm actually doing that's where I'm doing my masters. So I've I've always loved college football. And so my buddy was writing for a um, Washington Redskins blog, uh-huh. and it was about time for the NFL draft to come up. And so he's like, "Look, they want us to do draft projections and draft analysis. You." You love college football. You know a lot more about it than I do. You want to write for us? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we started writing, and I would try to inject humor into it, and just just because it's otherwise it's just dry. And I they liked it, and so when they the managing editor is like, look, want to do a podcast? 
I want you to do it, get Mark in on it, and then get a couple other. So we actually ended up, it kind of all started off as a TV pilot that we shot and it, that went right. absolutely nowhere. Oh, but it was, it, I made actually a couple of really good friends. A guy named Robert Henson, who, who was a linebacker for the Redskins for three years. Oh my God. That's so cool. Oh yeah. So it, the first time I met him, I had to actually pick him up for the pilot to shoot the pilot. Oh, so, God, were you starstruck? No, I, I didn't know who the hell he was at the time. Okay. He, he didn't play much. He, he busted his knee and uh, was injured his rookie year, came back and injured it again. And then, so after three, in, within three years, he was out. Oh boy, got but, it. But, we, you know, I, I didn't know who the hell he was. He didn't know who I was. I'm picking him up to drive him to DC to go shoot this pilot. And it, we just started talking and uh, we, <laughs> we, we went through some a re- really weird parking experience and we just kind of, we, we just started laughing and it, it just kind of, we just kind of clicked at that point. Oh, wow. That's really cool. So anyway, so they, they decided they wanted to do a, a podcast instead. And the, so we got Robert involved and, and me and my buddy Mike and another guy. We did 106 episodes. And then the station that was doing this got sold. And they're like, we're not doing podcasts anymore. So meanwhile, I've been, I've been writing and stuff for a friend of mine. Uh, a friend of mine that I knew for the same job I met my buddy Mike and that I'm doing the podcast with moved out to LA. And so one day he just reached out and he's like, Hey, I met this guy. I told him how funny you guys are. He wants you to write a script. Oh, like, wow. Okay. So me and Mike wrote a script and, um, it's his name is Eric Rosenbaum. I don't, did you ever watch Smallville at all? No, that's a super, was that the Superman kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Well, my friend David, his brother, his buddy Eric, his brother played Lex Luthor on that. Oh so, wow! Yeah, so we're like, okay, so he's legit. So, so we started writing for him. Nothing ever came of it, but when the first podcast ended, he was like, because he was listening and, and checking it out every once in a while, and and uh, we, we told him that the podcast is ending. He's like, oh, that's awesome! I'm like, oh, fuck you, asshole! So he's like, no, he's like, I I want to do a podcast with you guys. He's like, I got a buddy named Tommy. Like me and Tommy be out here in Hollywood. You two be out in in DC, and we'll just yeah. do sports and comedy. Because Tommy was a producer on Comedy Central for the Jim Jeffries show. Oh, holy shit! Damn, yeah. that's so. We did a hundred and six. Oh no, we did exactly a hundred episodes of that podcast. And when the Jim Jeffries show didn't get picked up for its fourth or fifth season, Tommy lost his recording space, so he couldn't re- really. He didn't have anywhere else to record. So. We knew it was coming, and I started doing this podcast. And this is, I am, I think, 397 episodes in. That's so amazing. Wow. So, yeah, so. You're um, real good, too, Mark. You're so natural. Like, oh, thank I, you. I didn't know you could write in. I mean, the interviews were so good. I'm like, I actually was talking to my publicist. I'm like, I listened to Mark's interviews, and I'm like, I don't know that he's going to know what to ask me because I'm doing bluegrass and he's such a rock and roll fan, and which is how I got, I'm not being recorded right now, am I? Oh yeah. I, I record am. everything. Yeah. But I, I edit the crap out of it. Don't worry about it. Oh, don't. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so embarrassed. Uh, but what I was going to say is that, you know, when we started hanging out, um, we were both like the thing that real we had in common is we're both like so from our core into rock and you know we were yep. like remember we went to go see the doors movie together and we yeah. were just like oh That's god let's go see it again That's and like right. we saw we blind, blind melon, melon twice right and then we saw blind melon twice i can't even re- you know remember the story but i can't remember how we got the tickets the second for the second night well but the remember? first night was sold out yeah it was sold out, and that's at uh you know stone pony yeah. where i go the time now because i'm right by there that's awesome and Shannon Hoon was hanging from the rafters, and we were just like, oh, my God, you go to a show like that, we're just like, oh, my God, it was so good. Yeah. And we know he was going to pass away, and that was our, you And I know, actually saw them a third time with Rob Wharton, so... Oh, hey, was that show good, too? It was amazing. It, it was... We actually ended up hanging out with him after the show, so it was oh crazy. My God. Of course, I go to... <laughs> Ice and that's the time you hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> we we met everybody except for the the really tall guy Rogers. That's the only guy that w- didn't come out. But Shannon was out there. Graham, Chris, and Brad. They're all 
all uh, hanging out at the bar. You know, wild times when we're young. I mean, that's oh. sort of, it's unfortunately still happens for me, but you know, it's because of my lifestyle. Yeah. The truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, Which well, we'll get I'm- into. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Yeah, but what I was telling, you know, this, uh, my publicist is that, you know, you and I were both so like into rock and of course rock was like such a big thing for us. And then as you know, I know you play guitar also. And Not we very play, well. You, you're better than me probably, but like. <laughs> I don't know about that. Not I anymore. I'll, play, I'll, I'll, I'll say that. We'll see. We'll see. We should find out. But, uh, you know, it's it's just so funny how your musical tastes, like, and I think this must happen for you, too, because your tastes are so much more eclectic than we were when we were younger. Yeah. But it's so interesting how, like, one band, like, changes or, like, brings you to the next one. And then you're like, I got to do that or I got to hear more of that. It's just so interesting to me. If I think about the person I was when we were hanging out, seeing rock and, you know, obsessed and like how I'm playing like acoustic bluegrass, uh, you know, in my main band. And it's, you know, I just, it's almost like a flow chart of like, <laughs> I listened to this and then this happened to me. And, you know, yeah, yeah that's I what the know. podcast is going to be all about. Just finding out how you got to where you are. So exactly. Like so, how did we get here? You know, we could probably do this all night, but true. we got to, we got to get up. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be a podcast for anybody, but you and me to listen to. So, the way this normally goes is kind of chronological. It doesn't have to necessarily be exactly chronological, but I, I like to find out how my guests got to where they are. Sure. So the first thing, it's full disclosure for everybody. Sheila and I grew up together. We've known each other since like fourth grade. That's when I moved up to New Jersey from Virginia was yep. fourth grade. So we either met in either fourth or fifth because uh, I didn't... I together. I remember we both had uh, Mr. Ercolano. Do you remember that? Yes. Erk the Jerk. I remember you from sixth grade. That's probably it then because I had the same teacher for every class in fourth and then uh, I don't know fifth I was still kind of getting comfortable with it because I came in mid-year fourth grade which is awful. Yeah that is that's brutal. But the thing is until really until after high school I didn't know how big music was for you and that was when we kind of started hanging out going to like you said going to see the movie the doors movie going to see some concerts together when did music really start to make an impact on you? When, when did it become a force in your life so it's really interesting so i was always see i don't know if you knew this about me in high school but i was involved in absolutely any musical situation i can be involved with much like my daughters i was in every choral ensemble I played the piano. I would basically kidnap my younger sister at the piano and work out harmonies with her. She's dying to go outside and go play with uh, the Osbournes next door. And I would, no, not until we figure out how to do this three-part harmony. And so I've always been like that. And I really relied on my piano. In fact, I learned how to, Patty Pinson gave me the sheet music to Stairway to Heaven. And I learned the whole thing on the piano. Oh my God. My mom, who wasn't even a Wayne's World fan, would say no stairway. Like, I <laughs> couldn't listen to it one more time. But then when I went off to school in North Carolina, you knew I, I went off. And yes. um, I had no piano, so I picked up the guitar, and I just kind of translated the chords in my head from piano. I would think in piano, teach myself uh, guitar. And back then, we didn't have the internet, so... I would just have random guys around my dorm room trying to learn stuff. And we'd like knock on each other's door. Hey, I think I figured out how to play this Red Hot Chili Pepper song. What do you think? And, you know, that's how I learned to play. Like in any element, it's always, for me at least, it's always community music. I had my dorm guys as my community. Eventually, I ended up having a friend who played drums. And uh, we started a band in the basement of the dorms. And I always had to have music in some way or the other. I even made, found my way back to classical music and um, sang in a choir in Princeton as an adult and everything. I just always had to have it in there. What happened is when I moved back to New Jersey after living in North Carolina, it turned out that my sister could sing and play guitar. And so we sort of were a duo. And that that would have been... I'd say like the early 2000s. We could okay. sing 
play together, write music. And it was very, you probably understand this, like as close as you are to a person, the stronger your connection, the better the music is because you get each other, well, you know, you're walking in. Yeah. And there's that blood harmony that, you know, with the Absolutely. sibling, it's just, that's a real thing. I, I honestly believe in that. So when were you starting to play in bands? I mean, was that in college or was it beforehand when, when playing out and in front of people with other, with other people? So that probably started about when my sister and I started singing uh, together and, you know, the early 2000s. And then we sort of met another pair that were similar to us. They weren't brothers, but they could play that way. And our good friend, Kate, who could sing the third part of our harmonies. And we joined together and had like a kind of a loose friend band, but we were playing out. Okay. Just that, you know, we all had full-time jobs or were in graduate school and just kind of get together on the weekend and uh, or, you know, after work and play. Then, you know, everybody moved on. They went to grad school or they moved away or whatever. But I had already gotten bitten by the bug and I kept going on and on. And in fact, my second band that I had with my sister is when I wrote By the Light of the Moon, which is the title track for the new album that's coming out. And I wrote it while I was procrastinating. I was supposed to be writing a paper for grad school. And I, <laughs> instead of that, why don't I just write a song? Hey. Because, you know, and so I wrote that song. We played it out with the old band and everything. And then I just kind of, you know, curbed it for a while. I met up with Magnolia Street, you know, Magnolia Street String Band came around and we just started doing like traditional bluegrass and like, you know, fast driving, hard driving bluegrass. I never really revisited that original song that I had made. Okay. So, and, so recently. So you, we, we talked about this a little earlier. Growing up, it was metal. Met, I mean, we were in New Jersey in the 80s. Early nineties, it was exact. Yeah, it was. It was. It was the devil horns. Everything was metal, and then at the time we we went to college, ninety one, grunge really exploded across the country. So, <laughs> how did you go from being a metalhead grunge girl to bluegrass? Okay, there's two different roads that led me to bluegrass. One is the dead which is also still rock. But if you know anything about Jerry Garcia, he is a bluegrass musician. He was very well versed at the banjo and, you know, and with roots music and all of that. And the Grateful Dead was a combination of bluegrass people, rock people, blues people. Right. And that's why have that signature sound because it's not all jazz people and not all blues people. So that's one route. The other thing is one of the most unforgettable days of my life. I was walking down Tate Street in Greensboro, North Carolina for the street festival. I'm walking and I'm walking and I'm hearing something. And I walk up and at the end of the street is a four-piece acoustic bluegrass outfit with upright bass, fiddle, mandolin, guitar, and they're singing harmony, which I have a weak spot for the harmony, as you know. Yeah. And I stood there with my mouth agape and... I just said, I don't know what this is, but I have to have this. I don't know how to get this, but this is it. And wow. that was huge. Like, that was a pivotal moment in my life because I did it. I'd never seen this. I'm like, how could there be so much rhythm and so much drive coming from a drumless, non-electric group? It was so amazing to me. And I just, I, I didn't even know it was called bluegrass. I'm just like, oh my gosh. I went back and told my roommate you won't believe what I just saw. She's like, uh, I, I, you know, let's put on some more Pearl Jam, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, and then eventually uh, one of my friends, Dave McCracken, who I went to college with, he's now in Dawn of the Buffalo. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's great. He was such a great resource for me, you know, in the internet free days. I would go over to his house and say, hey, how do I play this? Here, let me show you. So one day I went over there to try to learn a Dave Matthews tune. And he said, here, take this cassette. <laughs> and that cassette, cassette that I wore out was Alison Krauss. Oh. Now you take that bluegrass sound that I heard, you know, at the end of that Tate Street Festival. And you take the sweetest female voice I'd ever heard in my life. Yeah. My gosh, I just, I, my, the hair on my arms is just standing up, just thinking about her sound. And like when I covered it, her voice and, is like, a, the, it's like as clear as a bell. It's just impeccable. 
sweet. It's yeah. like a sweet. Oh my gosh, she's so amazing. So she's an inspiration. And so I think I don't know if that answers your question, but it's you know the two different routes. It's like witnessing it and you know transitioning out of the dead. Not I'm not out of the dead, but you know. Yeah, transitioning from the dead. You're still there, but you know you're growing, you're expanding. So right. And- Garcia Grisman did Shady Grove and, you know, that sort of the pizza tapes and that sort of thing. That's another crossover point for someone who may not be familiar with Blue Rest, but may like the dead. Oh, also, okay. I remember growing, see, I, I grew up with bluegrass. My dad loved bluegrass. Oh. So when I just moved up from Virginia, we would, he would go to bluegrass festivals each, every year. We would, sometimes he would take the kids, sometimes not, but so... I'm going to school, hanging out with you guys, and I'm, like, I'm coming home. My dad's got on um, the seldom seen, the country gentleman, Tom T. Hall, all and so yeah. So I grew Are up you? listening to it. That is amazing! So, wow, I did. I, it's funny, yeah, because it was always it was it was always bittersweet because when we moved up to New Jersey, I hated it. I I hated moving to New Jersey from Virginia, and we grew up. You know, some of my earliest memories are Virginia, and I remember listening to bluegrass at home in Virginia. And then when he would play it in New Jersey, I it would just get really sad. And <gasps> so it could just remind me of all the friends I left back in, in Virginia. And also, so it was something that I always loved and appreciated, but for a while I just kind of had to put it aside because I did, it was just too, too much attached to it. And oh. then, but then, you know, I, once I hit like high school, I would, it was one of those things where I would, listen to it with my Walkman. It was like that classical and Hall and Oates. I would listen to it because you couldn't, you wouldn't dare let everybody catch you listening to Hall and Oates if you were wearing a Megadeth t-shirt. You know, it wasn't like, I mean, my kids now, they're just like, I don't know about yours, but my kids listen to all kinds of stuff and they don't care. It's great. Absolutely. But back when we were kids, you get your ass kicked if you... Blessed. We all had our black t-shirts. With their- yep. <laughs> But you would get your ass kicked if one of the one of the, the guys on the back of the bus took your Walkman, opened it up, and there's a Hall and Oates tape in it. I might have been able to get away with it. I know it's the boys, you yes. know, but... <laughs> I would have gotten my ass kicked. So when I discovered that you're playing bluegrass, it just, it kind of blew my mind. I'm like, what? That I was not expecting. All right, so it sounds like as soon as you found it, you just dove in with both feet. What what were you listening to? What was, you said Alison Krauss and, you know, Jerry Garcia stuff. I mean, did you do a deep dive? Did you uh, listen to it before you decided to play some of it? Or were you just, I got to learn how to, I want to listen to this and I have to learn how to play it. So, you know, what's really weird is like, when I think back to that time, I just don't like, think about how informed we are these days. You know, your favorite band puts out a, a new single or an album or they're on tour, we all know within seconds and yep. you can share your friends in seconds. I'm starting to, I want to think back to like, how did I know anything back then? You know, I knew Alison Krauss cause Dave gave me a tape, right. but I know like, how do I find out more about this or how do I do this? So it's sort of laid, it, it laid dormant inside of me until I figured out how to do it. Okay. And when I figured out how to do it, that means, get your own acoustic guitar, start listening to things, start playing along and uh, start singing. And for me, the bluegrass picking style didn't come until I started playing with, you know, really great guys. But I would learn how to vocally sing bluegrass songs with my sister and harmonize. But I didn't know back then that there's a whole different way to play your instruments. You know, the same guitar that plays rock music and jazz, whatever, uh, is playing bluegrass and all the styles are different, as you know. So when I first got into Magnolia Street String Band, which is a professional band, they're like, we got, we have to start over here. You know, you got to hold it like this. You got to strum it here. You you, know, you got to hold the pick like this. And those guys were my guitar teachers, you know, oh, I, I was, and they're like just a bunch of big brothers. So I'm in guitar lessons every day with them, you know, they know they can tell me anything because that's how I get better. You know, it's just listen to them. And, um, they throw me under the bus sometimes and make me take solos. And <laughs> I, st- I finally figured out how to stop sweating when that happens, but I'll take <laughs> just so I don't have to say no. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. But yeah, that's, 
what happened eventually, you know, getting in this band and uh, in this band, like as the actual band and people who have filled in or subbed or sat in with us, I just, I've been so fortunate to play with so many incredible musicians. And that really does help you get better by seeing where you can be you just want to try so hard and like learn how to do it and oh yeah it's repetition but it's also not wanting to for for me anyway like not wanting to embarrass yourself in front of people that you respect so you pay attention and and, and you work hard all this is happening in new jersey yes and you will not believe this but the bluegrass scene in new jersey is Wonderful. That's what I was going to ask, because it does not sound like it would be vibrant at all. It is absolutely incredible. I can't oh. even... Uh, I'll see if I can just give you, like, a, you know, a little bit to help you understand. So, there are bluegrass jams all over New Jersey, and obviously Pen Pennsylvania is a different state, but, you know, yeah. on the... There's a humongous bluegrass presence in Philadelphia, if you check out, I think it's called Philly, Philly Bluegrass or something like that. All of my band, my sister bands, we all post the calendar there. There's just like a full schedule of bluegrass bands. We have a lot of friends in bluegrass bands. We borrowed their players. They borrow our players. And, and because it is community music, we can all play together. It's not like, you know, if you think about Weezer, for instance, you can't just take a member of Weezer out and then hope someone can fill in. Right. Whereas in bluegrass, we have an etiquette. I would assume it's similar to jazz, like a jazz seasoned jazz performer could hop in with other jazz players and play. Right. Same for bluegrass, as you probably know. And, um, you know, that's allowed us to play with more people. Okay. It's to say we're a band and we're a closed unit. Of course, you can join us on fiddle. Of course, you can join us on bass. And it's a really, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, we have a very nice community and just Something about bluegrass people, I just feel like everyone's checked their egos at the door. It just feels like a really warm, like, familial vibe. It, so that with all of them, really. It sounds a, very similar to the jam band scene. Actually, yes, very similar, very similar. You feel like this kinship with them, you know, It's uh, and it's, it's really lovely. We do have some bluegrass festivals that are close to us. There's one in New York, Gray Fox, that's a famous one. And then we have the Del Delaware Valley Bluegrass Festival. There are a lot in Pennsylvania. So you know, we play at the Wind Gap uh, Bluegrass Festival. And so that's, you know, in Pennsylvania yeah. as well. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of bluegrassers around here. That is awesome. So how did you end up playing with Magnolia Street? See, I, don't, I didn't want your podcast to be boring, so I'm going to tell you where I met the co-founder, <laughs> my very dear friend, Matthew. I, was, I had just given birth to my second child, and we went to my midwife's pie party. So mm. she has a pie party, and her husband happens to be a banjo picker, and so there's always a bunch of people picking bluegrass and country and all of that. So Matt it, was friends with my midwife's husband, Mike, and so he was there with his fiddle. I'm there with my guitar. We're all playing. We said, you know, we should play together sometime. We didn't get together right away. And, um, you know, when we did get together, we're like, wow, our voices sound really great together. Why don't we just call up a couple other buddies and see what we can do? And so that's how we got started. A few people had to leave for whatever reason. They moved or went to school or whatever. Yeah. And when we replaced our friends who were just kind of casually playing with us, we replaced them with real ringers, including Paul Prestepino, the late, great Paul Prestepino. He passed away here, and um, he was a legend. And he toured with Peter, Paul, and Mary for about 30 years. He played with Chad Mitchell Trio. John Denver was his good buddy. And I'll tell Something about that guy. He worked at Record Plant Studios, and he was not trying to brag, but at rehearsal, if you mentioned a famous person, he would have a story about what a prankster David Bowie is or how silly is so-and-so. And we're just, you know, what? And so he's telling a story after story, and it was just such a lovely thing to have, you know, just every time he had our, our jaws on the ground with who he's hung out with. And uh, so we had him and he 
was not necessarily a bluegrass player, but maybe um, maybe more of a folk guy. And okay. so it was a pleasure to play with him and be his friend. And then we added Bobby Baxmeyer, who is one of my best buds and uh, had play, played on many Broadway shows, including Motown. Oh, wow. Uh, Steve Martin's Bright Star. I mean, I, I can't even think about how many he's done. And he's not going to brag about it to me, so I don't know how to find out. <laughs> Let's but, do a podcast. Oh, yeah. You should call him up. He can play just about everything under the sun. And not only is he really talented, he's just a great guy. And he's a wonderful teacher and leader. And I feel like just being in his presence, you'll get better by being around him. That is Through awesome. Him. Yeah, so so we had him, and then lastly, Ron Greenstein joined us. He played with the Green, I think it was the Greenbrier Boys. Played with Doc Watson. Ooh, uh, wow! And uh, he is just he is a really funny dude, cool dude, down to earth, and he's a solid bass player and friend, and you know, just great to have him. And so that's what we have right now. And um, and our friend Gary Oliar, who plays with uh, Kenny Loggins and Messina. And all these other people, he he plays fiddle with us. Wow. But since you guys are all busy, I have subs too, who are also really wonderful players and people. So we don't have to say no if not everyone's there. We just figure it out. Because it's a good community. Everybody can just jump in. Yeah. Because of the etiquette. Kind of like mind control, you know. <laughs> Little telepathy with mind control. <laughs> so the band from what I was reading, started in 2013. There's an album, the first album came out in 2019. So there's obviously, if my math, my New Jersey math is correct, that's six years. Were you guys just playing live, practicing? What got you to the point where you're like, hey, let's, let's record an album? <laughs> secondly we tried to record on our own many times and it just was so sad it was too hard we couldn't figure it out i mean we had we had some it just it wasn't anything worth putting out so we finally bit the bullet and called up bob harris who is an, another legend i can't even start on his stories but what a great guy solid dude incredible incredible bluegrass guitarist and a wonderful producer and we all just got along so well with him. We made the album together. Matt and I helped with like, you know, comping and editing and all those things that you do, mixing and all of that. So we felt like we really had a part of not just the playing and writing music, but producing the album. So, so that was it. So yes, yeah, so it was like a learning experience for you. You got, you got to learn exactly you know, how an album is made. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's so much that goes into it. And, you know, you you have to think about, like, the sound that you want and the vibe you're going for. And uh, Bob just, I don't know what it is about him. He's got the magic. He really puts his finger on what you're looking for and helps you achieve what, what you're looking for. So it sounds like it was a good experience then. Oh, yeah. And we were really proud of that album. We are pr proud of that album. And I think I, I may have mentioned to you that we had a lot planned to, to do with that album. We had a little tour planned out and some radio interviews and you know that and then we got hit with covid and just sort of had to enjoy our album at home on our own yeah and, and we wrote music and we tried to you know use the acapella app and jam with each other we're all missing jamming with each other and then i think what happened is once things opened up after the pandemic i feel like if something happened to all the musicians that i knew that were just holed up and missing playing yeah all just like, I feel like everybody just, you know, exploded as soon as we were able to start singing together and playing. And <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we just, we played so many gigs last year, so many gigs this year. And I just felt like the more we played, the more we were inspired to like, you know, get towards this. Awesome. But this album is 
So I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I also teach kids music. Uh, in the day. And so I was at one of my schools and I was trying to redirect the children, you know, by improv with the guitar and singing, you know, somebody's crying in the corner and somebody's this. I'm like, I can change the energy of this room with my guitar. I know I can do it. And I did it. And I said to myself, you should really make a kid's album. Oh, awesome. You should really make a kid's album. So because I'm kind of weird and I'm a mom and I'm a teacher and, you know, I'm just I knew what. <laughs> But that was going to be nice and weird. And so I called up Bob and I said, listen, I just wrote a bunch of songs and I want to turn this into an album. He said, why don't you make a bluegrass album? I'm like, great. I wasn't going to make a bluegrass album. It was Bob's idea. So I said, sure. And he's like, yeah, no problem. He's like, Gary and I will help you. We'll, we'll play on Gary's co-producer. I said, great, let's just do this. And so I sent him my scratch tracks that I just made on my phone. We charted it all out, got the guys into the studio my sister wrote a song, and she's on the album as well, Rita yes. from uh, Somerville High School. She wrote this really great song, kind of inspired by her son. It's actually and one of my favorites on the album. I love that song. It's so pretty, right? And she's singing one, two, all the three, parts. One, two, three, to the waltz beat. Put on my clothes and my favorite hat. Time to have breakfast and then feed my cat. Dance while I do things. Morning waltz, and also I sing. Morning waltz, it's always in three. So one, two, three, one, two, three, come and join me. All right, before we get too deep into that, I've got a couple of questions about Wrong Side of the Rain. So I obviously couldn't help but compare it to the new album. And there's some differences because, if I'm not mistaken, your only lead is on those memories of you. In dreams of you, my body trembles. I wake up, I call your name, but you're not. First time I heard you sing, I was blown away. I it didn't it didn't match to me from the person I grew up with. Your voice was not what I was expecting because I remember you know just talking and hanging out with you, and, and I had never heard you sing. And then I heard your voice, and I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing! Aww, so thanks. So when I went back and listened to Wrong Side of the Rain, I was like, okay, I can I can hear in the harmonies and in the, in the backing, but I didn't hear you up front until those memories of you. Was there a, a reason that, that you're not as up front in that album? Well, you know, I have gotten a lot of criticism about that. At the time, I think when we were planning the album, Matt was more of the front man back then. Okay. Unfortunately, Matt is, has Parkinson's and is not really able to play. We did get him in on this album. But it's it's just not as easy for him to play and get out and everything. So since he's not there, I sort of assumed the lead role of this band. Okay. But yeah, it was more like it was kind of like Matt's, and I was sort of like it was it's our band, but it was kind of more like Matt's the lead singer. Okay. Well, I mean, look, that that makes total sense. And those memories of you and "Be My Friend Tonight" are to me are the highlights on that album. I absolutely love both of those songs. Well, you say you're leaving home There's somewhere else that you might rather be So you're leaving me alone You'd break the sky and let it fall on me Be my friend tonight Turn out the light and let the sorrow be I, I do like that song, yeah. And you know, the thing is, uh, with bluegrass, I don't know how receptive people are to covers. 
and we weren't sure about that. So we did want to put the ones that are more familiar, like the bulk of them are more familiar. And then we have a couple, three originals on there. And I think that's kind of the formula when you're first getting out there, you want to like reel people in with the familiar songs and then start sprinkling in your, your energy. That, you know, especially in a genre like bluegrass, where it's very, there's a whole, very big emphasis on traditionalism. So if you're wanting people to listen, the, I, I agree. I think the best way to pull them in is with, with a cover and then slowly start to sprinkle in your originals. It's almost like a, uh, it's, it, I don't, it's going to sound weird. This may be not the, maybe not the best comparison, but like a wedding band where you're playing a lot of covers Maybe you throw in an original or two, just kind of sneak it in, just to get people interested. And then, oh, hey, what was that song that you played that? I didn't recognize that. That's probably the best compliment a musician can have if they sneak a cover and somebody feels like they should already know it. It's really good. Yeah. Now, this this album is mostly original. I didn't have any of my originals on the last one, and this one is mostly my originals. My sister wrote one, and one is my favorite cover song. I don't even know if you'd call it a cover song, but yes. when I was loved all the kids' songs. And a lot of them, I, I, you know, I come to find out now as a grown up, a lot of those were kind of bluegrassy songs, you know, with the same like one, four, five format, which was very easy for me to just pick up the guitar and play for children as soon as that opportunity came because it's the same thing, you know? Yeah. But yeah, so I, I wrote these songs and I had told, I told my sister after I had that aha moment that I'm going to write this album. She's like, you're not going to do it. And as soon as somebody tells me I'm not going to do it, guess what happens? <laughs> so I put the pedal to the metal and the song, Mark, I have had like such a writer's block for so many years. And then once I said I was going to do it, they started like just coming out so fast that I'm pulling over on the side of the road, right? You know, quickly wow. record before I lose it. Or like I'd be getting ready to go to a concert with my girlfriends and I'm like, five minutes late because I sat down and wrote another one and they came out like this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I told myself I got to stop and it, it just stopped. And then I got all the you know music together, worked out the album situation. And then a whole other heat of songs came out again, but they're not kids songs. So that'll be for the next album. Oh, awesome. Just, so you got to thank Rita for all of this. Listen, if anybody ever tells you you can't do something and it motivates you to do it and kill it, then you have to thank that person for, oh, yeah. you know, not believing in you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your doubt. It's right. you a masterpiece, you know? Exactly. <laughs> well, I really, for being a, a children's album, I've really enjoyed it. It's a very sweet album and you have some special guests appearing on it. You did, like you said, you did have your former, your, your bandmate come in and sing on Oh Susanna, which I thought was just a beautiful way to end the album. I, that was really touching. I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. I soon will be in New Orleans and then I'll look around. And when I find my gal Susanna, I'll fall upon the ground. But if I do not find her, this man will surely cry. When I leave this doggone town, Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Oh, thanks for getting that. I, I felt the same. I, I was, it just warmed my heart to hear him on there. Yeah. And with my sister also, so it's like, you know, my sister and my, you know, one of my best buddies, and it just felt really like, you know, a good, good feeling, yeah. Do you also have your kids on there, which are extra special guests? Oh, yeah, definitely. So there are three songs that my three kids each sing, and each one is special uh, or unique to that child. I wrote a little bit about it to you, but I'll yeah. do you should I just quickly tell you? Yeah, yeah. Like, because uh, I know In Your Dreams has a very special meaning behind it, and it's a beautiful song. Thank you. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, my little one, Dhruv, he, he's seven and a half now, but he really had a hell of a time staying in his own bed. Oh. Or if I was out playing a gig, it's like, why, you know, why are you leaving? And 
that, that's a hard thing about this lifestyle is that you got to leave your kids and uh, yeah. go play sometimes. So yeah, that, that was a, you know, a sweet one for him and he really loved the song and he ended up singing on it. And it's just, to me, it's so cute. It, it even became distracting in the studio to us at times because we were so bowled over by his cuteness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the the song Cloud Fluff that, you know, I think I told you that when my daughter was younger, she just was obsessed with the idea of eating a cloud. Yep. And we just couldn't find any food that would be a cloud except cotton candy. So that that worked for them. And so I just expounded on that. And, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to eat cloud fluff and I'd like to eat moonbeams and, you know, so that, and I got her to sing on that and my sister is singing harmony. So it's my daughter and my baby sister. So that was a sweet little. That's one of my favorite on the album. I love cloud fluff. It's so fun. I want a rainbow. If I can, I'd bite right into that color. Band. Could it be fruity? I'd like to know what it's like to taste a rainbow. Give me that cloud fluff and sweet moonbeams, a sip of sunshine and starlight dreams. And then the last one, my daughter Sonia and I sing Forest Jam together, which to me, I, you know, I love hiking and being out in the woods and everything. I always sit and listen. I can hear the birds and the crickets and everything. To me, it's like a symphony. Yeah. But to me, this song is so obvious. You know, that's what you hear. I love it. Oh, and Morning Waltz, yeah. I, I love that too. That's that's a beautiful song. Rita did a hell of a job on that. She really did. And her voice is, ugh. Oh. She, she killed it. She barely had to try. Like, she just went in there so effortlessly. It was sort of annoying. Like little <laughs> brothers and sisters are. Very annoying. She's so good. Yeah, so I was so happy to have her. It just felt like a, you know, to have my sister and my kids, old bandmate, new bandmates. <laughs> you know, the newer bandmates are uh, Nick Conti and uh, Gary Oliar, and they're both on it as well, which is really great. Nick uh, ended up doing harmony on uh, three of the songs, Nick and Bobby and I, because... Since we're, you know, in Magnolia Street, we're like, let's have these three songs be Magnolia Street string band. So it was nice to have his harmonies that on is, that. Would you consider this a Magnolia Street string band album or a Sheila Shukla album? So I that I was going back and forth on that, vacillating and not sure where to land. And I asked so many people in my life and I had so many different opinions and ultimately, since we had that Magnolia Street String Band album in 2019, I said, let's go and make a second one and just have it fall under the umbrella because I couldn't have done this without them. There's no way. Like, you know, we all did our parts and that's what made it what it was. Yeah. I couldn't have done this without them. So I, I wanted that. to String Band and I think the next one will also be the same. Okay, so you mentioned having a whole bunch of songs just flooding out of you. How many, give me an idea about how many... How many songs you have lying in wait for everybody at this point? I think I have about 10 that I have written with the support of uh, my friend and my jam band. We've been writing together and I actually he encouraged me to learn how to use GarageBand. And we've been sending files back and forth with our drummer and uh, just kind of like giving each other tips. And then he's written a couple of songs as well. So we'll probably have, you know, multiple writers in this band, uh, you know, for this project, the okay. jam band. What I'll do is I'll take those songs and most likely turn them into bluegrass songs with that Miller Street Stream Man. That is awesome. So we'll be right back to Cosmic Bluegrass. Exactly. You ever get the urge to just meld everything together in one enormous band? Um, yeah, that might happen soon. That might happen one of these days. <laughs> that would be amazing. It might end up being my funeral, though, Mark, and I'll miss it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't say that. That'd be terrible. How often are you guys playing out? I know you know, you've got you know work and family and all. How how often are you guys playing out? And are you able to, to tour beyond regional stuff? Well, so I had other than like you know a three day tour here and there, or like you know a show in Delaware, a show in Pennsylvania. We haven't really had a chance to do a tour. We had, like I said, we had a mini one lined up yeah. in 2020 that fell through. But yeah, so we don't really, and we all have um, 
a lot holding us down. We'd have to probably give up other bands, other jobs in order to tour. I would like to do some, you know, like mini tours here and there, but I do have kids and I like being around them. So unless they want to come with me, probably have to wait on them. <laughs> hey, they're talented little guys. So Thank you. You can bring them on stage. Okay. So funny story. You can do what I saw last summer. I, I went and I, I uh, shot the Smashing Pumpkins <gasps> and Billy Corgan brings his kids out on stage and they sit in there. They, for like the one song, they just, they're out on stage. And they're just, they got their ear, their headphones on and they're just dancing around, popping around and they're little kids. So, uh, it's, so there's always that possibility. That's so true. And you know, my oldest daughter has just picked up guitar. Oh, nice. Learned in three days. Because she had ukulele for about six months, and then she said, "May I borrow your the guitar I use for my students, like for my smaller students? It's a half size classical guitar." And she just looked up the chords, and like with her her inner musicianship, she translated it. And she did what I did when I was, you know, seventeen or nineteen or however old I was. And I'm like, "All right, looks like we're doing this, huh?" Because <laughs> <laughs> it's inner. Yeah, this is going to happen. So who knows? Someday there might be a mother-daughter coming our way. It's in the DNA. Yeah, it'll be great. What do you have coming up? So the the children's album's coming out. Are there any upcoming shows? Any uh, Anything that people can look forward to? Uh, as far as, I guess, really as far as shows and performances. Yes, we, we're... We have a lot of shows left. I shouldn't say a lot, but we have, you know, some things on our schedule for this year. If you check out uh, Magnolia Street String dot com, there's a, a list of shows. They're all in this area. they will be New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, that sort okay. of thing. What is the best way for people to find the album, to, to follow Magnolia Street String Band and you and find out what you're up to and, and is there a social media presence? Is- on Facebook and Instagram. Our Instagram handle is MSSB Music. So at MSSB Music. Magnolia Street String Band on uh, Facebook. You can find us, you know, just by typing in our name. And then our website, as I mentioned before, magnoliastreetstringband.com. And yeah, so mostly those three ways, uh, a good way to find us. Our first single, By the Light of the Moon, will drop on July 26th. So if you're interested in hearing it, just check in to all the streaming platforms and take a listen, and I hope you like it. I think we're going to have another single later on, and then the full album digital, digital release will be October 4th, which is National Children's Music Day. Oh, wow. So it's going to come out on that day. That's and, awesome. And, you know, the thing about this, the children's album that uh, I wanted to mention to you, because to me this is like... The main point of this album is that my oldest is 14, but when she was a baby, you know, they don't tell new parents this. You have to find good music for your children. Yes. But instead, I was not playing good music for my child, and I was driving myself batty, losing my marbles at when she would say again, again to these really, I'm, I'm just going to say it, grating yeah. songs. <laughs> My friend from grad school, Inga, she said she gave me a stack of CDs and she said, listen to this lady over here, Elizabeth Mitchell. She's got a lovely voice and she plays with great players. Like, this is wonderful. She's playing like my favorite songs, but in a kid friendly way. She really helped me because I thought, you know what? I want to do something like her, but with bluegrass. I wanted to make an album that someone your age, Mark, my would age. listen your age (laughs) would listen to in the car on your own without a kid and just be like, yeah, I really like this. I'm like, wow, that's cool. Like I want that. And then when your child's in the car, I want your child to be like, play the one about the rabbit or, you know, that's what I, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Cause I was listening to it in my car on my drive to work for the past few days. So congratulations. Oh, I did it. Yeah. I don't, do anything else now because I've exactly. accomplished on it. The thing is, you know, what we give our children is going to shape their musical taste. The thing about bluegrass is that it gets a bad rap. I mean, or country, or they, you know, not that I love old country, but 
country that I don't like as much. And, you know, that is bluegrass is lump, lumped under that umbrella. And wouldn't it be nice for kids to hear some nice bluegrass and get it? You know, the, the way I always looked at bluegrass is basically the same way I looked at metal. Because it's these virtuoso players just playing at the speed of light. It's just amazing. It's just one's doing it with electric guitar and distortion. One's doing it maybe on a banjo. So it's, they're just still playing incredibly, a lot of times incredibly fast and incredibly virtuosic. And it's just amazing music. I've, I, I love bluegrass. Like I said, I had to put it away for a little bit, but it's always been amazing music. I've always loved it. And I was so thrilled to, to hear your album and to hear you were so into it because I think, I mean, you're a great ambassador for it. You know, it's, it's your, you know, an Indian American woman who is doing it, making it work, you know, being successful at it. And it's incredibly impressive. And I'm just blown away by the quality of the music. It's so great. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That means a lot. Thank you. Oh, no. 